sure if we have that written down. I mean, uh, Marchin would definitely be the one to talk to you about that. Sure. But I was going to see. can ask him later. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm here, so... Uh... Oh uh, yeah, can you guys bring me up to speed where we are? So far, Ian's been doing the work that he did with the modeling gazebo and uh, the simulation. Yeah, I'm Ooh. sharing my screen. This is the robot Ooh. rolling off of my little front act map there. <laughs> Wow, that thing is just moving. Can't stop it. Stop it. <laughs> wow. What is this program that you're using right now? Uh, this is uh, Gazebo, the, the open source physics simulator uh, that's associated with ROS. Uh huh. Is it used only for ROS or also for other applications like other physics things? Yeah, it can be used for other physics things. It uses actually. Um, one of like four different physics engines under the hood. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of just the blue in between a simulated world and a physics engine. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's like bullet physics. I think I'm using ODE physics currently. Uh, and there's Dart. They just hired one of the Dart developers at Open Source Robotics Foundation. I um, wonder if this is going to fall off the edge of the world. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no. Right, we'll can't stop it. Do it thing. It's kinda, I'm not going to it right now. I'm just kind of, you know. <laughs> Are you actually <laughs> testing the software that's operating on a on a tractor? Uh, not currently. No. Uh, I'm just. I just put all the parts together such that uh, uh, you could easily write software around it and okay. test it in simulation or on the real robot should theoretically the software should work on either okay so you basically pretty much put in the the mechanical properties and all that exactly mm -hmm. excellent screen should show off the, the r -viz portion like the so that gazebo and this is a ROS version of that just kind of visualizing robot data and transforms um with the transforms being like uh, showing when wheels are spinning, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What level of skill is required to to work with Gazebo? Like, how'd you do this? You you imported what uh, OBJ or? Um, unfortunately, the skill level is a bit. Uh, I've been working with this stuff for a couple of years now, and I there's no way to take the CAD files that you guys have and uh -huh. port them into directly into ROS or directly into Vivo. There's a, there's an exporter in SolidWorks that was written by a guy at oh, um, Willow Garage like five years ago and sort of works. But really what it comes down to is when the mechanical engineering team of my company is done with their design, they hand off their model to and it'll take me a couple days to massage it to the point where I have the right inertial matrices, the right collision shapes that I need, and uh, the right um, model, essentially, to mm -hmm. be able to pop Vivo versus Ross. Which is why I was thinking that I would help out in that part, because I know that would take a lot of time for somebody else to do. And you, you have it right now? You, you've you've yeah. done it? I open Excellent. sourced it. It's all up on the Ross Agriculture website. Uh, let's see where where do we find it? What's the link to that? Sure, I can. Uh, is that in our working document? Yes. Is it in the working doc? I didn't put it there myself. Sign up to be a member of the Open Source Ecology Wiki. 
yeah, you can. Uh, it's in a the working document is a Google Doc, which is just embedded in the wiki, so you don't need any permissions for that. But yeah, for oh. the wiki. Um, so I just cool. pasted the doc working doc into the chat. That well, that's the page on the wiki. You can click edit below the. There's an edit bef under the working document to get into the working document. Cool. Yeah, I'll go through and add in links to the things I was doing. Um, the thing I was mentioning to people earlier, uh, I did not simulate the arms. Uh, okay. The tractor. That's all right. A little complicated uh, because of kinematic uh, closed kinematic chains, and I'll figure out a way around it. Mm-hmm. Yep, we've got actually uh, updated. Uh, just yesterday, we updated the loader arms and the curl cylinder. If if you need that, the the actual cylinder geometry is correct right now. Oh, cool! I'll go back through and, and import that again. Yeah. Cool. March, do you have any idea how much the tractor weighs? Two thousand pounds. Uh, I went through that number before, uh, like when I was doing the, the tractor calculations from last year, and this is pretty much, uh, very much similar in terms of the components. So 2,000 plus minus 25%. Um, <clears throat> power cube is only going to be 300 of that. So the rest is track and frame and arms. I did some guesstimation and that's roughly what I meant about the power cube. I remember you said 2,000 pounds for the whole thing last night. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now for the kinematics part regarding the speed, we just went through some numbers. The speed is very slow on a single solar panel. Actually going through the real numbers, it's actually 1.2 feet per minute on the one solar panel that we have. Though if we run the engine itself, that's going to be walking speed. Yeah. So we're going to have the attachability of either a power cube or just the power cube that's on there already. We can basically plug in one or the other into the the valves. Yeah. Uh, so, so Matt, what about um, any of the content as far as the system, uh, the hardware, or the, the software, rather, the, I guess the software is the biggest question. Did you start start on that? So, um, most of the work has been with the simulator that Ian did, and then Jeremy is working on the software stack that will control this model inside of, inside of his control. Uh-huh. Um, is that the, is that the software that's actually going to run the tractor? Same thing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome, bud. Nice. Mm -hmm. Do we know the status so of that? Or? Um, we're just, uh, digging into that. We're put, so basically it's kind of like you have a bunch of packages and then you got to pick out what packages you're going to use, depending on what sensor. Uh-huh. And that works. But I think that's going on pretty good. Um, putting together some hardware to take out there and software. Um, maybe some functional safety stuff. Um, when that tractor was driving off the, the map in uh, Disney Globe, mm. how do we stop the machine? You know, the, uh, we need to maybe add, add some, you know, limit switch or something. How do we stop it if it goes, goes yeah. AWOL? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well... I guess for safety, the if it goes out of control, then then we just uh, I mean you can easily pull a plug, as in 
like you can disconnect the hose or uh, probably easier would be to disconnect the power from the what the the source of power so if you disconnect the power the solenoids shut off and you can't the tractor doesn't go anymore just something to think about maybe we can kick around some ideas mm -hmm. um, put a little pressure switch out front on the nose of it uh -huh. or something and then um, you know with fan we'll have a um, e stop so if we can, we can shut it down and just like a button, you know, you push yeah. if you want it. Just... Right. And and as far as the hardware stack, I mean, um, cause, so if we're going to implement this, so you guys have a lot of the sensors and parts that you can bring, or do we have to make some orders, or what's what's the situation? Um, I am going to buy um, some e-stop switches, but um, we have all the rest of the parts. Okay. Okay. So it'll be... Uh, we do the design as much design as we can for the event and then you guys will be set off on integrating that when the event starts is that yeah I like the idea of using the big tractor uh -huh. if, we, if we can get it working in simulation then uh, when we go out there um, day one we could start on the big tractor okay testing the interface spreading right around uh huh so the idea is to have the software completed so we plug it uh, we, we wire up the the hardware and make it work yep. how much of that do you I mean how much of that design work can you do beforehand can you start drawing up some diagrams of that like more detailed diagrams so we have that for reference or are we ready to do that we're ready to do that pretty simple uh, just GPS, the two two sensors, I think starting out, and then a Raspberry Pi. But we can, I can put that in the document. Yeah, yeah. As far as okay, here. So so yeah, put it put it in as many of the components as possible, such as we've got the solenoid, and you know, just just think about all the connections, how we're how we're making the connections, what connectors we need, because that's yeah, all those all those kinds of things. Um, we may need a relay in between the Raspberry Pi and those solenoids to drive them, but yeah, 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 we've got those. Definitely, you will. Um, so, do we put a link to the relay already? Yeah, yeah, we got the link there um, on page number one. It's the simple relay. Now we've got those, so um, we've got spares of that. We need a, a four-channel relay for forward backwards on each motor mm-hmm uh, what about like things like enclosures and stuff what do we do for that um, maybe maybe prototype it on some kind of a, a board of some sort like a Let's see, how much space does this take as far as the controller? Do we want to just use like an electrical enclosure and put all that stuff in? Exactly. I like those little boxes from Home Depot, whatever. Okay. 20 bucks. Okay. Do you have one in mind that you can get or? Um, I can some... pick one up. But, yeah. but I like those. Those are really sturdy. The, the plastic on there is pretty sturdy. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. As far as the the document itself, can we maybe um, let's see implementation. Let's see. Um, can we maybe start a page so mechanical well system control system electrical system integration slide. Let's maybe slide do a slide here. That's just basically uh, putting more detail onto what's on page one. So, uh, so right now <clears throat> we've got. Do we know what open source? Well, no, the G, not open source, but the GPS module that we're using. Yep, we have a couple of them to test. Here's the switchman one. This will give us um, sub, sub about ten centimeter crackers. We have to have two of them. Swift nav link. Uh, you got the link. Is it what page? Yeah, on uh, page Four? under implementation. Swift nope. nav. 
No. It's under automation test to test these. So I've, Swift I've got a couple Pixie. of these other things, testing Earl Brain, Pixhawk, all these different things. Those are just, if we get it running the first day and we want to play around with stuff, then there's other things that we can do. Earl Brain has a 5 megapixel camera, so we can test some sort of vision tracking. Um, the PX Flow is uh, an optical flow sensor, so we can point it towards the ground and then give us an estimate, estimate of how far the robot's moving in which direction. And then I've got a little Pixie, which is uh, optical follow. I don't think we're going to get to all those, but those are just some of the fun stuff to do with it. Okay. Uh, that. How does that connect to the Raspberry Pi? That's like Pixie? Yep. Yeah, IC2 is the uh, standard connector there for um, those. The SwiftNav uses USB. Uh, Pixflow uses uh, USB. Mm -hmm. I have some limit switches, but I don't know. I don't have. Um, I've got limit switches for 3D printers. Yeah. But. Uh, You know, like an one. If we put something on the front of the machine. Mm, okay. Um, we have to. How do you do that for if it's a brute, you know, a brute? Uh, so we have to rig up what that would what would let that device look like. Are you familiar with those? How do you get a limit switch on a device that's gonna face thousands of pounds? Yeah, well, it's like um, like a like a pressure bumper. So, do they make uh, those? Have have some, do, what? do they make those, or is that a homebrew thing, or? Uh, the switch itself they make, but you can make the bumper out of anything you want. They also sell like a pressure, like it's a soft material that if you push it, there's a switch inside of it. But I don't, I don't know. If we can add that later. In which order will we use the? We're going to use Pix. Swift Nav Pixie first. That's n number one. Now we use a different GPS IMU combo. Which one? It's from 3D. Earlier Robotics. Earlier Robotics. The first one you have there. 3D. No. Uh, so yeah, Earl, Earl Robotics. If you click that GPS IMU, it's under page four on automation. Yeah. Compass. Uh, that's, that's the GPS. GPS it, plus compass. A newer version, but... And um, that connection is, what is that connection? I squared? Uh, no, what is that? Exactly. Oh, it is? Or serial. It may be serial coming out of that one. It's got so two wire the, and a four uh, wire. Okay, um, and Jeremy and Jeremy's not on the call, right? No, he was not able to make it tonight. Okay, so you and Jeremy are gonna um, basically wrangle that. Are you familiar with the one this this one? Like, do you have that already, or? Yeah, I've used it on um, many vehicles before. Uh huh, and. Um, so you have you have that that you can bring. Okay. So we'll start. So this we're we're connecting to the um, to our Raspberry Pi, and with this GPS and compass, is that like the minimum viable prototype? Is that enough to do GPS? That's all you need, or you need more? Yep. No, that's the minimum. Um, so we'll see how it runs. Like you said, that you know, a foot and a half, we'll see how it runs, and then maybe we can hook up a motor and see what it does at three miles an hour. Uh huh. Okay. So you're about a meter accuracy. Um, so you, it doesn't really know exactly where it is, but um, the software will take that GPS and the IMU, and then we'll kind of connect the dots, and so it'll help smooth things out. 
to to better than one one meter or no that's after no. the yeah so i mean this one is not a real um accurate mm -hmm. strength but if you if you started out on on the edge of the field and then you drove it one day and came back the next day um and told to go to the same path like i'm gonna have waypoints or some some way to direct the robot um it won't it won't actually hit that path. it'll be shifted It'll what? Sorry, it'll do what? Uh, it'll be it'll be somewhere within a meter. Okay. Yeah, this GPS is these will give you about ten centimeter. So if you went out and got a GPS coordinate and then went out the next day, this one will take you. Um, you'll be within ten centimeters. Uh, which is what is the one that you pointed to? It's called Swift Nav. Okay, the Swift Nav. Okay. That's 10 centimeters? Yep. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now this is the low quality GPS. This one's a thousand dollars for this set. They, the newer one uses two satellite constellations and it's uh, much better. But I think that one runs two thousand dollars now. Which, the one you just pointed to? No, the new one. Sorry, the new. How much is the one that you just had in your hand? The <clears throat> grand. Oh wow. Um, okay. So if it works with seventy dollars, so that's the huh. way to go. <laughs> yeah. So as. Uh huh. Raspberry Pi Plus. We call that. Ublox Neo. What do you call that thing? Ublox, Neo M8N. Ublox. How do you say that? Yeah, we call it Ublox. Ublox. Okay. Uh huh. So minimum viable product is the, is the Raspberry Pi plus U blocks. See, so we'll see what that can do, and then go from there. Um, is that how open source is this? Are these devices? <clears throat> I mean. And what do we say? Is there is there any versions that are open source? We said that the chips ultimately are not open source, but uh, so proprietary chips. But um, is there any other one that claims itself to be more more open source? Like for example, what about the Arju Pilot? Is that what is what's the comment on that one? Uh, that's the GPS that I am you will be using. The one that they use on there. Wait, the U blocks? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not following. I thought we said so. We're doing U blocks GPS. That's GPS plus compass only, right? And the. Can you explain what the difference is between? So we got this GPS plus compass, and then we've got the IMU part. Which, t can you tell us the difference again? The difference between an IMU and a GPS? Well, so, okay, so GPS IMU, this is this U blocks entity thing. So, what did you say, right? Is that correct? So, uh, I was asking where does uh, ArduPilot come in? Is this what ArduPilot uses? Pilot is software. Um, run it on different hardware sets. Oh, so Arju Pilot is just software. I thought that included the hardware. Okay. Can run it. Um, there's two different controllers: the 3D robotic cells, the Pixhawk, and they have a little Arju Pilot. I don't even know if they're selling that anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right.
Let's see. So the hardware is Raspberry Pi, GPS, I mean, and then you say tests using other more advanced forms of, do you still call those, do you call those, what's IMU stand for again? Like an inertial measurement unit. Inertial measurement unit. So the other options are also called GPS IMU units. So IMU is just a sensor. And a GPS is just a sensor. There's a lot of people that make GPSs. There's a lot of people that make IMUs. And you can spend two bucks on an IMU all the way up to, um, I don't know, 30000 mm -hmm. With a GPS, you can buy them for a couple bucks all the way up to fourteen grand, fifteen grand, actually probably even twenty-five grand. So it, it just depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The IMU is usually a combination of two to three sensors, uh, a magnetometer as well as an accelerometer and a gyroscope with various um, numbers of degrees of freedom that it can measure per, per sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gyroscope, accelerometer, and barometer are typical? Um, so sometimes they have barometers, but uh, gyroscope, accelerometer, and magnetometer. Magnetometer. Uh, and yeah, okay. Depending on the version of IMU, you might either get streams of data from each of those sensors, and then you need to do the filtering yourself, or sometimes it'll just give you the filtered coordinates of uh, where you are in space. Uh-huh. I see. In other words, like, so when we use PixHawk, we're still connecting, for example, if we use PixHawk, do we still connect it to a Raspberry Pi? So it's Raspberry Pi plus GPS IMU, the, the, the U blocks as an initial one. So in the tests using, you're saying we're going to replace the U blocks with one of those others or just use one of those others? Do any of the other ones have their built-in microcontrollers or computers? Yeah, Earl Brain and Pixhawk are both microcontrollers. They're complete autopilot systems. Uh -huh. The Earl Brain open source. It runs on a Raspberry Pi. Uh -huh. It has a hat on there, so you can just easily plug in the sensors. It has a 5 megapixel camera, so you can do vision tracking and maybe even obstacle detection, like people people tracking or something like that. What does the Pixhawk run on Raspberry Pi as well? No. I think it runs on a Cortex M4, but I'd have to look that up again. I don't, I don't remember. Uh huh. Um, so your, your thing was, you said you would test SwiftNav Pixie that runs on Raspberry Pi or? So the GPS, um, the Roperty, the PixHawk and just the regular Raspberry Pi, they can all read, uh, the GPS signal. Um, what's the, when we if we do the Swift Nav Pixie? I'm just trying to get a picture of what all we're doing there. So, um, so I'm seeing the minimum viable product of Raspberry Pi plus the U blocks. What what if we do the Pixie route? What are we using with that? So Pixie's um, a GPS, so it would replace the U blocks. Okay, so that replaces the GPS. Um, it's GPS IMU or just GPS? Just GPS. Just GPS. Okay. I see. Um, can you maybe like, uh, yeah, like, would you be able to maybe in our implementation path, like maybe write out some of those details so we can take a look at that for reference? As far as what we're doing. So right now, the main focus is just uh, Raspberry Pi and the uh, 
block sign and combo. Okay. Running boss. Okay. That would be the primary focus. Okay. With the standard. All those other things are just, just playing around. Okay, okay. So we've got that. So that's connected right to the solenoids. The Arduino with RC Shield is going to be another route. That's a parallel route. That's just not not the GPS route, but just a, just an automation route, right? Which is uh, so another person is bringing that to the show. Um, but those are independent parallel paths, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So on that Arduino, okay. do you have the, the connection into those solenoids? Or is, does the Arduino power? That's back on that other document where it powers those relays. That four. Yeah, uh, from Arduino you go to re <laughs> relay to the solenoid. So, in both of these routes, I believe we're gonna it's gonna be like this. I'm I'm on page two. So with, whether we have the Raspberry Pi plus U blocks or the Arduino with RC Shield, you're gonna go through the relays, right? And then go to the solenoids. Perfect. With, yeah, so that's that's cool. the proper. Okay. And just I just well that pathway's already been tested. You know, there's enough power. Like if the Arduino has enough power to um, power the relays, then the Raspberry Pi will also. Yeah, Arduino does have enough power to power the relays. Let me see. Let me just think about that. You can get five or twelve volt relays, so we have to get the five volt relays. Uh, okay, so we should make that. Because Arduino does 5 volts. Yeah. Yep, so make sure I get I get those. Um, right. So you guys are good on a side of the Raspberry Pi plus U blocks. And after that, for any power, like the relays. Um, I guess the specs are that for Raspberry Pi, it's got 5 volt out, outputs. Is that what it has? super low power, maybe we can, instead of driving it from the Raspberry Pi, you just uh, close and come to ground. No, sorry, sorry, say it again? So, I, I'm not, I don't know, that's the one thing that um, I'm not clear about yet. Okay. The I.O. on the Raspberry Pi and hooking that to the relay. Okay. Uh, can you look into that a little bit? Should be almost. It should be identical to the Arduino. So uh -huh. if you guys have tested that path, um, it should be good. But I definitely I'll look that up. Okay, uh, we've tested it using. Well, we, we did that a lot with the printer, 3D printer, because we're running the heat bed now off a relay. But we were just going through a 12 volt output. Yeah, we were using the ramps shield. So. Uh, we have not done the 5 volt direct to 5 volt relays yeah, so in the, this the instance. Power source. Yeah, however, we did do that. I believe we the controller we had for the brick press, we were going 5, five volt relays. So yeah, I'll just check on that and make sure we, we got that side covered. Mhm. Mm yeah, it's it's either that I have to get uh, the five volt relays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm pretty sure. I just want to verify that those five volt relays can be driven directly off the Arduino, which I'm pretty sure. Mhm. Mm yep. So verify. Check yeah. the um, how much current source from the GPIOs on the Raspberry Pi. That's the that's the key there. That'll tell you whether or not. Also, the voltage if it's the three point three volt or five volt. I'm not sure which. The the Beaglebone Blue that I have pointed out at some point, but not seem to put in this document for some reason. Should be able to do that. Okay. Wow. And it's a uh, it's Linux as well. Mm -hmm. Open hardware as well. Software. Mm -hmm. Better connectors and better I.O. on that? It's 
designed for robotics. Yeah. Uh huh. Also, I think the BeagleBorn is more open source, right? Correct. Well, maybe we add that to the, the list of things to test. I recommend it. I've been playing around with it uh, with my Neato, uh, Neato LiDAR that I have on my desk, and it works really well to drive it as well as read the data from it. Yeah. Um, I have a beagle bone black rot lying around here. Would that work? Uh, probably, actually. Uh, the blue is just kind of good connectors for. It's essentially a beagle on black with better connectors for uh, essentially robotics applications. So mm -hmm. I'll put it up in there. Essentially, these connectors and then some servo connectors right there, as well as a, a lipo connector there. But aside from that, it's identical. Uh huh. at a store or is it pretty much just online order? That's a great question. They only came out in April and I ordered them pretty much the day of <laughs> so I could play with it. Uh, I don't think. Maybe if you have a micro center nearby, you can have it there. <clears throat> I, I saw them on on uh, Mauser and uh, what was the other one? Arrow. Oh, I didn't see them anywhere else. I think Mauser is a distributor. But I don't want to distract too much. If you can get what you need to get out of the a raspberry pie, and, and, and if you're comfortable with that, then go for it. Those connectors come in super handy. Yeah, they, they were pretty awesome. It's good for prototyping, at least. And the servo drivers, that's that's nice, too. Yeah, Yeah, it has two built-in uh, drive driver circuits on board, so you can actually drive things directly. With them. And it already has an IMU on board. It does have an IMU on board. That's a good point. I forgot the collection to say that. And it does can? Yep. Wow. I tell you, it, like, I, there's a reason I ordered this the first day. I'm like, boy, I've been waiting for it. That's mm -hmm. pretty nice. And it has encoder inputs, quadrature coder encoders. Or quad encoder inputs, yeah. Super nice. I agree. <laughs> That could, that could come in handy. That's open source. Well, okay. I guess um, might not be bad picking up one of those. <laughs> if yeah. nothing else to play with, I <laughs> if, it, if you had like um, an image for Raspberry Pi, can you load that image on there, or is it different? Different. So, yeah. I mean, it's not going to be super different. It's going to be basically the same deal as uh, uh, what are the uh, Raspbian is what they use on the Raspberry Pi. It, it's just a, a Debian for uh, ARM architecture. It uses ARMF, uh, the hard float uh, ARM architecture. So very similar, but not identical. But it'll just run Linux the same way uh, Raspberry Pi will. Yeah, those connectors, those are, uh, and having having the ability to read in all those there's easily, that's a big advantage. The light bulb oh. battery is pretty cool too. On top of that, the icing on the cake is it's actually got a built-in Wi-Fi Bluetooth module on the top there, so you can just attach uh, a bigger um, antenna on top. So it has a little micro connector. Yeah, it's got these guys, a bunch of uh, two micro connectors for antennas. Really yeah. Yeah. Never be hired as a or show model for room. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. It's at least worth considering. We we have a lot of options. So, um, yeah, it's about, <clears throat> yeah, like nine days from now or so. So, Matt, you think you'll have everything you need by that time or? Yeah. 
Okay. Yep. I, I think we can get it going. Um, that that Beagle Bone Blue is nice. I, I wouldn't mind just getting that. Uh, probably just order one just so we have them. Um, but we have a lot of electronics, and uh, Jeremy has a lot of experience, and Ian has a lot of experience, so I think, uh, I think they'll be okay. Okay. What else do we need to cover today? Anything else, or? Uh, I've got a question. Um, going back to this IMU, um, since we're doing a tractor, uh, size isn't as much of an issue. Couldn't you do a more open source uh, version of, of all of this uh, by just getting the components separately instead of integrated? Like instead of the U blocks, get three separate things. It's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Maybe that electrical engineer or something would know uh, how how to do that. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there was already a project or something where they're making sort of a less a less uh, optimized version where it's just separate parts. I don't know if the IMU on board the Beacon Bump Blue would work, but that's open source. So what would be wrong with, with it? It's not accurate enough? Or? Yeah, potentially. I don't know how accurate you need it to be, but luckily it's probably especially connected directly to the frame. Right. And I guess the other question would be if for, for more long-term or, or even short-term. Uh, how important, if you're, if you're using computer vision, then can't you get most of the information that, or actually all of the information from computer vision? That's a research project. Okay, so there isn't something, I mean, for example, you can, uh, can you figure out how fast things moving from, from the, the, the uh, video stream? Yeah, so you can. I think I, I missed the first part of what said you were. You said you were having connectivity issues. Oh, was I? Sorry. Oh, I don't know why. Um, yeah, let me know if that happens again. But the technique you could use uh, is called optical flow, and so that's where you take a, a series of camera images and uh, look at the features, so unique parts, which might kind of be hard in a farm field. I'm not sure. Um, maybe not. Maybe you'll get enough of the horizon and enough trees that you can get some interesting features along the way, and then and just track them image by image um, to come up with an estimate of the vector that you're moving in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you probably want an IMU though, because the estimate coming out of the optical flow will probably be. Um, you might be able to get something robust, but it probably would take a couple of weeks, months. To yeah. Get yeah, that's the computer vision route. That's as as you said, it's a research project, but definitely worth you know some of this stuff worth open sourcing if there's good work on that. That's definite ripe material for open source, Lex. Just like with getting the the separate sensors. I guess the point is here. Once we see this going, like we can ask much better questions. And this being prototype one, we can do something very quick, and then we can. Um, make improvements on that, such as doing more open source routes or whatever. But so Lex and Josh, they're both be there. Matt is going to be there, and so is Jeremy, who's not on the call, and I, I will be there. So a lot of us here are on uh, going to be at the event. So we'll get some ideas brewing after we see that. So that will be a good outcome of the of the actual build. Yeah. I guess on the mechanical side, maybe some sort of stopping feature in front. I want to work on that or think about that. And then on the 
software side is um, getting those models that Ian put together, getting the software stack in there, and then being able to drive it around. Yeah, I've put together the repository in such a way that you can just keep adding to the different uh, packages in there. I just I tried to get a base organization such that it would be easy to essentially drop files in wherever it made sense. Uh, And sorry, did you link yet to the the document where you're doing that? Yeah, I have it on uh, which page? Is it? Page three at the bottom, software implementation. Uh huh. Both, both All right, got it. So there's no. I want to emphasize no code there. It's really just taking the three tag models and converting them and massaging them. Mm-hmm. What is that format that I use? Uh, yeah, it's the Universal Robot. That's UIDF. Um, it's, uh, I can actually put a link to the loss of the on there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's actually a, it's a method for describing the kinematics and dynamics of Uh huh. So, um, you're currently using all that software to in order to make that translation. Yeah, it's on open source projects to uh, one called Lobos. You can wonder to do all of this. Go. Uh, I've used it a little bit. It's okay. Um, it's not stable enough for me to uh, like trust my robots with it. Um, but uh, yeah, this is one area. Uh huh. So easier tool chain for just getting the, I mean, just getting the CAD in in there. You're saying, yeah, just on the CAD it's, part. It's not just the CAD, right? It's like the it's the physics associated with the CAD, which is why I was asking questions about right. uh, cost distribution. Uh, because in, well, in mobile robots, I I've not worked with them so much, so I don't know how important getting mass and the inertial is aside from when you simulate it. I got the inertial matrix wrong initially and the computer started tumbling off and um, so getting that stuff correct and essentially it's true to the real world it's important to be able to simulate the robot to be this later. Mm hmm Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it looks pretty impressive though on uh, on that Nice cracked dirt in the background. <laughs> uh, thanks. I just inserted that model right before I took it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I was look, I was mentioning earlier that I looked a little bit into importing uh, terrain, um, and I think it's entirely possible to grab the factory farm uh, terrain, but it'll take some massaging of the whole Yeah. Um, so if you guys have any inkling of the weight distribution of the different parts of the tractor, um, feel free to talk about it in the document, like the drivetrain uh, for the each of the uh, each of the rack plus wheel plus motor assemblies for each side, as well as the frame, as well as the arms, as well as the 
buckets. And the pistons, those are the ways that I broke down the URDF. Um, I can figure out the inertial tensor from there. And that is for the accelerometer? Um, that's actually just for uh, as far as I know. But uh, sorry, uh, for what? Sorry, for what? Uh, I'm curious. Uh, I'm not sure you heard me, but but the the mass distribution is related to. So you got your inertial test tensor. What is the which which sensors are related to that? No sensors. No sensors. It would just be so that the model functions as opposed to real life in. I see. I see. Which, I mean, I don't know, for the first approximation, what would the difference be between treating it as a... I mean, if you if you did not have any of that information about mass distribution, I'm not seeing how that would... Uh, like, like, for example, you're saying like how it would bounce on terrain and stuff, like how it would roll and fall over and stuff. That That's the kind yeah, of stuff you... Ah. So to be completely honest, it's not particularly important because uh -huh. I made pretty good guesses. Yeah. And it costs it in the simulator and it all just work. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the best guess. If you don't have anything else, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, the guess you made, did you put the center of mass right right at the center pretty much? Because it's. The center of mass is based on the mesh. Uh, but I don't have. So that affects the yeah. Uh, all right. That's all. Let's see. I put it. Uh, I have it right here on my guesses, which were. Uh, I guess so. You said uh, the total mass is about two thousand pounds, is about nine hundred seven kilograms. I figured the frame itself is maybe three hundred kilograms. The arm assembly is two fifty kilograms. The power cube is fifty seven kilograms. I underestimated. It sounds like and I'm guessing that the motor plus the tracks are about 150 kilograms. Can you share your screen? Yes, sorry. I, this is just the... Uh, I'll highlight what I did. They're just guesses that I put inside of the yeah. yeah. Track, I think tra one track plus motor is about 300 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, How good. Did you say the, bucket for the what? The, the tractor bucket. How the bucket? Um, raw bucket itself would be like, um, it's only a four foot wide bucket, um, 200 pounds. Okay. And that's part of the 2,000 pound total? Yeah. Something, okay. something around that. Yep. Yeah. And if I get a chance, I will be uh, uh, writing or creating a URDF and find translate that the tutorial so other people can time. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let's see. So, as far as um, the relevance of that for the uh, the software, so so as soon as the software is written up, when we can tell how it's going to move move around, like, are you actually able to test 
kind of like it's based on the sensors it has, like how it will move across the field, like base the code you give it a certain code and you'll you'll basically see okay this is how it's going to move you'll you'll see the you basically execute the motion in the simulation is that correct that's the hope yeah um i've not worked with mobile robots so much before right. so i'm a little less familiar in this territory but yeah. at least in my my experience with robot arms uh, what i'll do is i will build the simulator such that i can send the exact same code command into the simulator that I would into real robot, and ideally have the same sensor data come back and have the robot actuate itself similarly to the real world, such that I don't need the thirty-five thousand dollar robot hardware in front of me. I can just simulate it on my desktop. Yeah, yeah. Does Gazebo have any decent documentation? Yeah, their documentation is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Is that under active development? Uh, it is. It's on the, uh, every January they release a new version, and every other version is a long term support, so like a five year support. Uh huh. You, do you know those people there? Or? Yeah, I know them quite well. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, seems like it's quite active. It's definitely not dead. <laughs> yeah. They even got a good looking website. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and how much does, uh, like, when, when Jeremy is working on a code, uh, is he looking forward to your software? Like he, that's like critical for him, or or it's just an extra. It should be an extra. I imagine you can easily build a Ross robot without all of this, but this is a nice way to get a lot of the software. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if it's raining and our machine breaks on the field there, you can just go in on your computer. <laughs> do uh, that instead. Theoretically, that would work perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. The theory looks great on paper. Let's let me just say that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, anything else to cover in this meeting? I think we're we're pretty good. Um, sounds like Matt's gonna you know he's gonna come with some elect electronic hardware. Um, we got the tractor waiting for you here that you can start testing. We hopefully we'll have the robotic simulator uh, actually doing productive, actually meaningful results. And yeah, we'll see how we get there. And then I guess the outcome of the actual build will be okay. This is what we got here. Uh, what do we learn from it? How, what new ideas are sparked? I think that's going to be we're going to get a lot of good ideas from this, like as far as where to go on some practical applications. For us, the immediate very practical application is just a simple chicken tractor. I mean, if we succeed at that and uh, you know, have flocks of chickens safe from predators that are operating on acres of land, that's, that's got economic significance. So that's good. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I think that's one good case, case to focus on. That's a definite uh, useful ap application. So we'll see. All right. All right, team, go, team, go. Any other things? No. Okay. Looking forward to it. It'll okay. Oh, it's it's already gonna be next week, man. Time flies. I... <laughs> okay. Better do it. Okay. Okay, guys. So sh now, should we check in next Tuesday before? Uh, so Thursday, I guess, is the. Let's see, the fir Thursday is the the training day. But should we check in on Tuesday, yeah? Just where we are? Just a brief check-in? Yeah. Okay. So same time, same channel. Next Tuesday. 
and this was recorded so wh whoever missed any of this it's going to be online to share it to the world okay thanks a lot guys so we'll we'll meet again next week on thursday on tuesday and then in person and th on thursday <laughs> all right thanks guys see ya take care bye-bye